life in three, two, you'll see a sign when we go live. Yeah. Okay, we are. All right, I'll take a picture for the gram. Hello, and welcome to the pre-book launch of Academic Wellbeing of Racialized Students. My name is Oyenda Mola Alaka, and I'm the Promotions and Publicity Manager for Friendwood Publishing. I'm excited to kick off this event, and please do subscribe to Friendwood's YouTube channel to know when we have our events or other exciting content. To start off, I would like to acknowledge that I am calling from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 Territory, homelands of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homelands of the Metis nations. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the arms and mistakes of the past and the present, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and cooperation. As an immigrant to this land myself, I recognize my privilege as a settler in this land, and I dedicate myself to working in partnership with Indigenous communities in my location. Tonight's event is brought to you by Friendwood Publishing in collaboration with researchers and academics of Color for Equity Network, RACE, R-A-C-E, 
as well as the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies and Racialized Students Net Academic Network. You can pre-order a copy of Academic Wellbeing of Racialized Students via our website, fernwoodpublishing.ca. It is currently 15% off till next week, Friday, March 5th at 11.59 p.m. Excuse me. When you pre-order a copy of Academic Wellbeing of Racialized Students, do know that royalties from the sale of this book will be going to Racialized Students Academic Network. So please do support the student group by buying a copy of this book. Some housekeeping before we start. There is a live chat on your screen. Please leave any questions and comments there. There will be an opportunity towards the end for the speakers to answer any questions you have. The chat is also being monitored and any racist, sexist, homophobic or transphobic comments will be dealt with it. Going forward, I'd like to introduce Dr. Benita Bunjan, the editor of the book we are celebrating tonight. Dr. Benita Bunjan is currently an associate professor at St. Mary's University in the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies. Her research examines organizational and institutional power relations with a focus on colonial encounters and nation building within academic spaces and workplaces. Dr. Bunjan is deeply committed to the academic well-being of indigenous, black, and students of color who are often seen as bodies out of place. And to her responsibilities and responsiveness regarding the complexity of indigenous settler of color relations. She's currently the faculty coordinator for the Racialized Students Academic Network, RSN, who royalties from this book that we're celebrating today will be going to. And she currently works with racialized students and international students at various universities to promote their scholarship rights, well-being, and self-advocacy in the areas of academia, tenancy, and mental health. Hi, Benader, it is such an honor to introduce you today. Thank you so much, Oyenda. Thanks for all your work and generosity and a big thank you to Fernwood. I am so proud to have Fernwood as the publisher. I have watched Fernwood grow and take amazing risks and, and I think you are on the right path. That's what I have to say. So I'd like to introduce Michelle Paul, my good friend. Um, Michelle is a Mi'kmaq Treaty Rights holder in Mi'kmaq. She is an amazing teacher. She gives, she shares, she's a mother, she's an auntie and a, a, a collaborator of great ethics. Um, her constant engagement with land and water protection is where our paths crossed um, a, a number of years ago when I moved here from Coast Salish territories to Mi'kma'ki, particularly the anti alton gas um, and, and many other movements that you have been part of, including Elsie Poktuk. So if I was to remember a quote, Michelle, that you have said, it is, who will speak for the water? Who will speak for the sweet grass? So I'm very honored and feel very blessed that you will do the opening and you will bless this event as well as the sacred words that are in this book. Oh, well, all and thank you, Benita, for your kind words. Um, I'm very honored to be asked to do the opening for such a, an incredible piece of work by you and, and all the students involved. Um, I am a Mi'kmaq mother. Uh, my daughter is 16 years old, Shanoa, and she, it's, it's her future that I think about most when I, when I do these things, um, particularly this book. It's the words in this book that my daughter and younger students and younger people, youth like her, will learn from. So I have some medicine going here. And I just want to say words from my heart, not really a prayer, but it's my blessing. I want to give thanks and gratitude to, to you and to all the students involved. And I want to particularly point out the relationship and the connection that you build with all of these young people. I want to offer um, gratitude for our, to our ancestors and I want to offer gratitude to you for doing that because it's very essential 
in order for all this work to be done, decolonization and all of this important work, we need to develop those relationships in a good way. And I see that with you since I met you. I met you on a panel many years ago. And I remember myself feeling a uh, fish out of water. I was sitting on a panel with all PhDs. And I remember myself feeling like the oddball. And in my activism and in all of my advocacy work, I remember you reminding me of my strength and my power. And we began to develop a friendship since then. And when I reflect on these works and books such as this, it's that sort of relationship and that trust and that respect ultimately that we all need, uh, particularly in the academic setting, um, in order for us to engage each other, to learn from each other and inspire each other and to really achieve all of the work that needs to be done in so-called Canada. Um, particularly I'll speak here in Mi'kmaq. Uh, we really, uh, we've come a long way. We have uh, flags, Mi'kmaq flags flying on campus. 10 years ago when I did my studies uh, on, on those campuses, that wasn't a thing. Um, it's a small symbolic um, stride, but we have such a long way to go. We really do. So I wanna honor those relationships that you have built with these students to bring that trust and that respect forward in this work. And I, and I really wanna bless this work tonight and, and give thanks for the gift that it is offering to the world, to the young people, into all of our relations. So Mulalan and Sonoma. Mulalan, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for being with us. I want to introduce one of our uh, graduate student, uh, Tammy Williams, who's also a Mi'kmaq consultant, program coordinator and teacher at the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. She's completing her master's degree in women and gender studies, focusing on decolonization, uh, decolonizing methodologies. Um, it's, it's been um, really amazing to get to know you, Tammy, and your perseverance, both as the work you do in the community, but also for every piece of work you do with your family, your daughters and the, the grandkids and your mother and your grandmother. I mean, you've got a good, strong five generations. So uh, please share your poem that is published in the book. And Tammy also has a chapter in the book. Thank you so much, Benita, for that awesome introduction. Um, I know I wouldn't be here right now without you guiding and, and supporting me while I was struggling through some of my classes and trying to balance everything. So I really appreciate the opportunity that you gave to me. I also wanna say Walalan to Michelle for opening the, the session up with a nice prayer. Thank you. Um, so this poem, I, I wanna introduce it briefly because it mentions another poet laureate and as a teacher, I had introduced her to my class, um, or actually I, I introduced her works to my class and um, they really gravitated towards it. So we used it as a, a building block. And that's where this, this poem developed out of. It's in response to Port Laureate, uh, Rebecca Thomas. So decolonizing intentions. Rebecca Thomas says, don't feed us your good intentions. We don't mind the modern inventions, but your intentions are full of hidden motivations while you subjugate our conventions with decades of litigations that you deny our race exterminations. Fingers are crossed behind your backs as your other hand extends in reconciliation, spreading misinformation about withholding tax giving settlers ammunition for degradation. As we try to argue the facts, settlers' ears are filled with colonial wax. We fight to protect this land, thinking seven generations ahead. So when water stops flowing and we stand on empty riverbanks full of poison sand, and as we write letters to ever-changing letterhead, there's no one to blame on the witness stand. Your good intentions are corrupted by money and power and can't be disrupted. 
So when we cry for the land and poisoned water, your good intentions mean nothing for my granddaughter. When she learns of your intentions based on your greeds, she will decolonize the world with her indigenous knowledge and deeds. That's it. Thank you so much, Tammy, and we all wish you um, um, good energy and send you good energy and completion of your master's degree and all Thank the work that you do. So we will move into the panel now, and um, um, I want to introduce um, um, the book and give you a little bit of a uh, a snapshot into where it came from. Now, I know there are many elders um, across the the across Turtle Island, who had hoped we would all be on Zoom and we would all be interacting. Um, so I apologize, that is not the case uh, because many people have said, "We'll see you there. We'll see you there." Well, you uh, you saw me, but uh, and in to live stream and to do it the way we're doing is the best way to do this, and and it protects um, the space in a very particular way. But if you have any questions about that, you can email me and ask me about it. So the book begins when I'm a, a master's student or the idea for the book. And it was uh, at a time where I was being heavily mentored by Dr. Yvonne Brown, a Black Caribbean scholar uh, from Jamaica who had come to Canada many years ago. Um, and uh, we organized a workshop together at University of British Columbia. And the focus um, of it was, does academia feed you? Does academia feed you intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and physically? And that was the starting question. Um, and we began to do a series of workshop over time in the last, let's say 20 years. So I really want to I, uh, I really want to honor Yvonne Brown um, by planting that seed in me. And chapter 12 is a chapter between with my mentor, Yvonne Brown and I, um, where we really speak about this, this uh, idea of um, academia feeding us. So it's with great excitement uh, that I offer the release in April of this edited collection that centers the voices of indigenous black and students of color within the academy on Turtle Island. It draws from papers presented at racialized students conferences or panels for and by racialized students, often under my mentorship, but as well as intellectual collaborations with peers that center critical race feminist intersectional frameworks. And these conferences include the Racialized Students Resistance Conference in 2014 on Musqueam Territory, several SURF Conference, the Critical Indigenous Race Feminist Studies Conferences in Jibuktuk, as well as panels for the National Women's Studies Association in Ganawagi Mohawk Territory, Montreal, and Ohlone Territory in San Francisco. And, and for example, Iseline was the one at, at, in San Francisco with Artia Rumagam. Um, the collection includes art, photographs, poems, spoken words, thesis chapters, academic papers, from those that dare to create hybridized transformative spaces of good relations and knowledge creation and community building. Such gatherings are critical and rare academic spaces that ensure students further develop their own theoretical visioning based on their intersecting identities, lived histories and struggles while promoting their overall well-being individually and collectively. The collection is the first of its kind to be envisioned in relation to the positionalities and leadership of diverse writers across geographies on Turtle Island within a transnational context. And I would say right now we're having a transnational moment, uh, uh, not only transnational on Turtle Island, um, and I should mention Iseline is in St. Kitts um, right now, and we are, we've, we're all part of this entanglement of, of uh, the encounter. 
The book discusses the experiences of pain and trauma through visceral colonial violence within the academy and larger society. Stories of trauma, exclusion, displacement, and pain across generations and migrations clearly are connected to imperialism. Many of the contributors' journeys in and out of academic spaces include feeling out of place, being an imposter, and not belonging. The book emphasizes the ways we survive and strive to build communities of care while carefully creating strategies of well being and resistance. Networks, mentorship programs, and conferences become pivotal sites of learning and engagement, but also of retrieval and remembering, such as where we came from and the path we will choose to move forward. The journey is very painful, but along the way we have come to this brave space of alternative teaching and cathartic healing. Academic institutions within Canada, a white settler society, remain troubling sites of racial exclusion and racial disentitlement, lacking critical indigenous black and race scholarships and scholars. Undergraduate and graduate students who are indigenous black and racialized across multiple intersections of gender, sexuality, citizenship, language, student status, such as international students, place of origin, accents, migration, displacement, different disciplines, experience a diversity of embodied material isolation, silencing, and erasure. Drawing on the work of Said Ahmed, this edited collection explicates how and why racialized politicized students are produced as specific bodies out of place in Western Eurocentric academia, as they are constructed to be unsettling the happiness that constitutes white supremacy within universities. By foregrounding their scholarship on indigeneity, blackness, settler colonialism, queerness, trans, belonging, language, migration, and nation, the book demonstrates that it is imperative for alternative and subversive educational models to emerge within and outside the academy. Academia in Canada can be understood as a site of colonial encounters of differently positioned subjects within simultaneous contact zones. Contact zones like classrooms, instructors' offices, libraries, group lab work, student campus services, departments. Renessa Mawani refers to these contact zones as a space of racial intermixture, a place where Europeans, Aboriginal peoples, descendants of enslaved Africans and racial migrants come into frequent contact. University spaces such as classrooms are powerful sites of socio-geopolitical, local and global intermixing of international students, domestic students and instructors across the intersections of their positionalities. So while the academic journey of racialized students often begins with pain, this book centers their academic well-being created from forging transformative spaces and relations in and beyond the university. Academic well-being is the capacity of academic institutions to carefully conceptualize and implement with relevance the policies, pedagogies, curricula and services that promote the mental, physical and intellectual wellness of students. Further, it is when academic institutions fail to build and deliver on this capacity that students search for spaces of comfort, mentorship, resistance, networking and survival to promote to then promote their individual and collective academic well being. In this book, I focus on the academic well being of racialized students over three intersecting themes. The first is barriers to academic well being. The second is acts of resilience and resistance to white supremacy within academia. And the third is the nurturance of reciprocity, care, and kinship. I first met each of the contributors as students living their complex lives. 
which are always informed by historical, geopolitical, ancestral, collective, and individual landscapes. I affirm that their act of writing for this book is itself well-being that is full of courage slash rage and situated in transnational kinship relations. Transnational kinship relations, the focus of chapter 12, refers to the encountering of individuals from across the globe and the making of non-blood kin relations due to struggles and experiences of otherness and outsiderness, as well as through collective resistance and resilience. Thank you for listening to what I had to say about the book. I hope it excites you all to want to read these very powerful words. And with that, I want to introduce the three, um, pat, the three panelists, which then we will have Q&A. And then we will close with Timmy Idris sharing a poem. So Wayne Desmond. Hi, Wayne. Wayne was born and raised in the African Nova Scotian community of New Glasgow in Nova Scotia, Mi'kma'ki. He's a St. Mary's University alumnus who majored in criminology. He's currently a student at Dalhousie University enrolled in the School of Law. Wayne is a committed son, uncle. I've seen the, the son and uncle for myself and a mentor and activist. And I'm really proud to see that Wayne is also writing uh, recently for the Nova Scotia Advocate and bringing the voices of students and young black men to the forefront. After Wayne, we will have Vanessa Mitchell. Vanessa Mitchell is an Okanagan silk woman uh, whose Emmy graduate research from uh, uh, University of Br British Columbia focuses on Indigenous methodology. She developed and now manages the Journey to Aboriginal Cultural Safety and Humility program at Interior Health. She advocates for meaningful ways to address the immense in inequities that Indigenous peoples experience. And Iseline Phillip completed her MA in Women and Gender Studies at St. Mary's and is from the Caribbean island of St. Kitts and Nevis. Her research focuses on the marginalization and exclusion of women of color in positions within organizations, authority, leadership, particularly within academia. So I'd like us to welcome our three um, speakers. And I first met Wayne in a criminology class that I was teaching and, uh, and have gotten to know him um, as he moved through university. Um, Vanessa, you remember our courses in UBC Okanagan, also methodology, just a bunch of courses. Uh, I wanna be able to say we took together, but unfortunately I was the instructor. I would have much rather wanted to be the student. And Iseline is my first MA student that I supervised at St. Mary's. And I still feel that your whole committee, and I don't know if it's the first, but it feels like your entire supervising committee was for the first time, did not include any white faculty that we were all racialized. And I felt like it was a moment of legacy. So we'll begin with Wayne. Thank you, Benita. Um, hello, everyone. Benita's already given me a very thorough um, introduction. However, I just wanna do it again and just cover some like, you know, grounds here. You know, my name is Wayne Desmond and I am an African Nova Scotia man from the community of New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. I was raised by two strong and resilient African Nova Scotian parents where I need to put an emphasis on the strong and resilient because that is where my journey began and is the foundation of the chapter that I wrote that is entitled, My Long Search for Black Spaces. Before I dive into my chapter, I need to pay respect to my ancestors, the ones who were captured, caged, and shipped to the Americas, to the ancestors who paved the way for my future, because for their sacrifices, I can. I need to give a special thanks to my grandparents, my, grand, my parents, and the community of New Glasgow who've always supported me. 
The chapter tells the story of the education system as a black learner, having lower expectations placed upon you, being streamed into IPP foundation and essential courses that will not equip you for the post -sec for post-secondary education and the promotion of attending NSCC opposed to university. By no means am I saying that university is better than NSCC, but it's the ideology that Black people aren't supposed to attend university and don't belong in the world of academia. But from a critical perspective, Black people have been a part of academia for, a long, for long periods of time. Throughout my time in public school, I couldn't find my space within the education system. The educators didn't look like me, the curriculum didn't walk with me, the textbooks didn't reflect me, and the education system didn't respect me. Unfortunately, it wasn't until I entered university in my third year where my voice as an African Nova Scotian learner was heard and validated in an education, educational setting. When I was 15 years old, I was working for an elderly man who lived across, the, lived across town in an affluent part, part, part of town. I would often cut his grass and complete other routine maintenance. This man would often pick me up at my house and drop me back off. One day on the drive back to my house, he asked me if I had any plans for the future. I responded and said I want to become a lawyer. With a puzzled look on his face, he, he said that I should reconsider my career. The whole idea with him really telling me to reconsider um, my career was he didn't think of a black man that um, I should become a lawyer because there was more, quote unquote, what he spoke, there was more qualified white lawyers out there that would be hired. For those, well, Benita already acknowledged it. I'm currently in law school now, so um, I like to think, and while I know I just, really broke that barrier like you know the seal that he tried to put over my head I really just broke it off and you know I'm in law school and I know that the future is going to be bright um and that I'm going to be a lawyer so where do we go and what do we do we must continue to challenge the narrative I want young ones who look like me to know that they can do whatever they set their minds to that their future is not limited to the Eurocentric narrative as Benita mentioned earlier, does academia feed you? And unfortunately, it never has fed me. I had to feed myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. And uh, we all here value your experience and your, your families and your ancestors and, uh, and uh, give you lots of energy as you move and navigate Dalhousie University and law school. Um, I'm going to ask Vanessa, would you like to be next, please? Why, slach lach, is please Vanessa Mitchell, can teal seal in East America Mitchell, Nelf in Tum, Chris Marchand. Hello, my name is Vanessa Mitchell, and I'm here in the Seal Nation in the interior region of BC. Glad to be joining everybody here today. And I agree, Benita did a great job introducing, so I'm just going to jump right into it, being mindful of the time. My chapter is called, It's in the Past, Get Over It. And my question is, is it in the past? And one of the things that I want to start off with here is, you know, when I think back to my story and to share what I could share here today in regards to the chapter, in grade school, I once had a teacher literally tape my mouth shut for talking too much. I was in grade one. And so that makes me think of voice. And as I think about this chapter and the works, you know, I just want to speak to the, the shoulder, the Indigenous peoples need to shoulder the burden of proof, whether it's our identity, whether it's our voice, whether it's our perceived experiences of racism, whether it's identity and belonging. And, you know, when I think of me as an Indian woman, and I'm using that term as it's based in the Indian Act, which is a piece of legislation based solely on race that exists here in these lands, many identify as Canada. You know, in this journey of academia, I really needed to explore what does colonization mean to me, my lived and my living experience as I am still here. 
And I really needed to reflect on that in my undergrad and really look further into that in my graduate studies. Because we can know about colonization, we can be impacted by colonization at very young ages, like me getting my, my tape mouth, um, my tape, my mouth tape shut. But what does it actually mean? How can I intellectualize all these emotions and experiences that I'm, I'm having? So who am I and what is my identity? And through this, I explore, well, I'm my parents' child. Well, how were they raised? What were their experiences of colonization? And how did that interweave with me being the first generation I realized in that exploration to not go to Indian residential schools as my father did? to be the first generation to not be a part of the 60s scoop as my mother was. And also part of my identity is being Okanagan. What does that mean for me? Who am I? And being a woman as somebody who identifies as being a woman and a mother and a sister and an aunt and a niece. And those other further questions, you know, how further is my identity shaped around my parents, my family, my community, my nation, land, territory, place, and story. And then I explore further, how has my surroundings shaped my identity? The environment around me, legislation, um, terminologies and colonial ideologies around get over it, those narratives that intertwine with my lived reality of being an Okanagan woman. So as I entered and became a student in the academia, even though I am Okanagan, I still have much to learn and must follow community protocols and ethics. So when I'm considering that question, what is my research question? I felt like everything was backwards. They needed to know what I was going to do and how I was going to do it. And I was like, no, I can't. I need to wait for my community to tell me what I should do and how to do it. <laughs> so that was backwards for me. And for me, community ethics and protocols supersedes that of the academe. So I really needed to decide what I was going to explore as a topic. So even the act of figuring out what your topic is and what you're going to research and how you're going to research it, because you know the ownership is not truly in your hands. Ownership is in the university's hands. So how can I respectfully navigate being an Okanagan woman with responsibilities, doing a research that feels meaningful to the community, hopefully, and I can only say hopefully because it's only the community that's going to tell me that. But also meet the standards of the university. What is permissible? Being mindful of all those pieces. And I'm so grateful for those who have gone before us to provide tools such as terminologies around Indigenous methodology, methodologies and participant action research so that I could use those to really center in my research on seal teachings of my people and grateful to all Indigenous peoples and leaders who have gone before me and have created that path and my hope is only to contribute to that path and as I reflect further you know some of the things in the methodology that made me think I need to ground the research to place to land to story to teachings and I'm in my own journey of exploration of even further knowing what it means to be Okanagan, but I knew I needed to begin within my community and within my nation. And to ensure that I was following protocols, I needed a community advisory to guide me. So even though I'm Indigenous and I'm from community and it's within my own community, I still have my protocols that I need to follow. And I also need to be mindful of trauma and loss and of traditional knowledge, as I've said before. So as I'm listening to these words and hearing them be shared in circle, I need to be able to report that back and say, did I hear you correctly? Have I captured your words in a good way? And if I need to remove anything, let me know. Because again, community ethics to me supersedes the academe. And it's also for my own integrity. And trauma and loss. You know, while doing the, the, the thesis and the research, being mindful that I had to stop and cancel and reschedule for there was loss in community or there was a loss in a nation or a neighboring nation because we have kin kinship ties, individuals to community, to nation and to neighboring nations and lands. 
So knowing that those things stop when there's trauma and loss. So all of those protocols and responsibilities that I'm just touching on a few are, are important to be mindful of. And also reporting back and following up again. Did I hear you? Did I do this in a good way? And in doing this and wanting to uphold community ethics and still navigating the academe, you know, there's always that question of validity and legitimacy. Is what you're doing valid? Is the practice that you're doing valid and legitimate? Is how you're doing your data analysis? What is it based in? Prove it, shouldering the burden of proof. And academic and SEAL member Bill Cohen states, as a matter of fact, the Okanagan are the people of the stories. Our knowledge, survival, and cultural practices have been maintained through story. And further, that Okanagan knowledge, values, and ways are also valid academic knowledge. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this as a way to heal and center and claim or reclaim my identity, my place, my belonging, my voice, and my song, and my story on these lands. And when I think of the work of navigating these pieces and my own journey, I reflect upon those journeys before me and note that this is a place for me to stand up and be responsible and sing my song and push back when I need to push back and hold that space, hold that space so that I am elevating our protocols, our community, our way and I'm only one person and I'm certainly learning. I by no means am an expert. I say that loud and clear. I know there are so many more people knowledgeable and I look to them. And for the people for future generations is why I do this work and in honor of those before me, my mentors, my aunties, my grandmothers, my grandfathers and my ancestors to continue to do this in a good way, even in spaces that feel unsafe and who you know, in grade school, I once had a teacher literally tape my mouth shut for talking too much. I could probably say that at every phase of my life. And um, I, I'm grateful to you, Benita. And it is through um, art of visiting and story and humor that has allowed me to survive and the humor of my communities and my peoples. White Linlin. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, it's, it's a hard place to be. This is a very emotional because I'm so connected to so many of you. It's really, uh, um, it's very, it's so much affect and feeling and emotions as I listen to all of you. I have to take this moment to give great thanks to the Okanagan people who welcomed me. The first time I was ever part of a ceremony where I was officially welcomed on a territory. It was Vanessa in an office at UBC Okanagan who actually did a whole ceremony of welcome to the territory. And when I had, when life was hard in the Okanagan, white supremacy was hard. And um, I felt the, the strong protection of uh, the Okanagan people and particularly Vanessa. And, uh, and I want to acknowledge your auntie Molly who recently um, uh, um, traveled to the spirit world um, and the, the tremendous gift that she gave to many of us. I'm moving to Iseline. Iseline, take it away. Hi. Good, good evening to everyone. I'm really honored to be part of this panel as a contributor and being part of this project. So I guess the first, hopefully, of many. Um, I authored the chapter in the book, chapter four, titled, Where Are the Black Female Faculty, Employment Equity, Policy Failures, and the Overrepresentation of Whiteness? Um, I kind of want to begin by letting people know just, just it's similar to how I introduced the chapter by positioning myself and kind of describing what motivated me to do um, the research that I did. Um, so I particularly researched employment equity policies within the university space. And I was really driven to do that based on 
my own personal experience being a university student. So I was an international student um, coming from the Caribbean island of St. Kitts and Nevis, you know, sending everybody warmth um, up in the north, which is where you are right now. Um, and I came to arrive at university at St. Mary's and, you know, um, kind of having a reckoning of being in a predominantly white space and living and operating in that space and kind of experiencing uh, different aspects of racism, just in, just in being and living and being and going about my, my daily life. And of course, and being in academia and this lack of representation. And as somebody who's always been particularly interested in policy, which is what I work in now, I would always see, you know, statements atta attached to job postings that say, you know, we are an institution that welcomes applications and of, you know, persons from marginalized groups, including women, people of color, indigenous persons, persons with disabilities, et cetera. And yet, you know, I would see this uh, repeatedly, <laughs> uh, routinely. And, you know, my, my thinking was like always like, well, where are all the black people at? And so I was really, really, that kind of really drove me to, to, to explore uh, the effectiveness of these policy prescriptions and these, these, these statements. And so I um, found Benita, well, Benita found me, we found each other and we went into doing a real research project. And I remember when I started, Benita said, are you sure you want to do this on this university? And the Dalhousie, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and I remember saying, yes, um, because I it was really coming from a personal place for me. Um, and, you know, I want to share a small quote in my introduction, which kind of highlights and describes uh, the motivation. It says, I quote, when I enter an academic space where bodies like mine are not visible or represented, the discomfort I feel is not because I am inadequate or because I lack confidence in my abilities to thrive in this space. I'm uncomfortable because despite institutionalized messages that convey diversity, I do not feel welcome. And, you know, I think what that quote does, it kind of captures the experience of being in a space that is obviously predominantly white. And even despite having these uh, policies and these statements that should, uh, should actually in practicality produce diversity and produce inclusiveness, it's doing quite the opposite. And so bodies like mine, like black bodies, indigenous bodies, bodies that are non-normative um, still end up feeling unwelcome and still are, are in this space where it's, 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 you have this complex where you have you know, imposter syndrome and you're, you're struggling to kind of maintain yourself and maintain your confidence in this space. And so this research was really, it was kind of for me, kind of uh, looking at being a, adding, applying a critical eye to um, uh, these policies, looking at well where the gaps are to expose to policymakers, to expose to the institution that what you say you're doing on paper, in the actuality and in actual fact, you are not doing. And I would say that you know, in um, having done the research and having applied you know very critical analysis and produced you know data and analysis on the on 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 the topic that. In the end, you know, I'm quite happy to see that the impact, um, the kind of impact that my research was able to make, because essentially the message that I believe I wanted to send and was able to send was that if we really want to achieve equity, diversity, and inclusion in practice within these spaces that we know are predominantly white, that were never intended for bodies like mine, if we really want to achieve this, then we really need to be intentional. We need to be very conscious about how these systems of domination operate, even when we have um, policies uh, that are intended to, to work for us. They actually do a more of a disservice to us. And so we really need to be a lot more conscious, a lot more intentional, and we need to take a lot more accountability for the ways that um, things are not working, uh, but, it, as a, but really instead they're just working to maintain a status quo. And so I think, you know, just with what we're seeing and conversations that are being had, that, you know, that is happening more, that people are having more of these conversations. And I think that that's the hope 
that research like myself, which is like Vanessa and, and Desmond, where we, we, we share our voices and we share our perspectives um, for that to be invited and for that to be taken on. So, uh, you know, I think really powerful. I think, you know, I would encourage people to, to get the book and to read and to really see what the research says and to, to, to gain these perspectives, these analytical perspectives that, again, are not common, they're not status quo, but they, they are what is needed to happen to help shift and change the conversation so that we can really achieve social transformation. Um, I'll leave it there and welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Iseline, um, for being with us today and sharing your uh, very important um, research, which has been a great gift to, to both the universities. And I know that the SMU administration, I believe, attended a presentation that you did and is trying to also learn from um, your research. It's always amazing when our research ends up being part of uh, praxis and, and gets drawn on. So I'm going to welcome um, anybody who is watching right now on the live stream YouTube to please send your questions to Oyinda um, because we have uh, uh, our panelists are ready to answer questions and they want to be, um, they want to be able to engage and talk about their research and where they're at and their writing in the chapter. Um, so as the questions come in, um, a few have come in, but I'm going to wait for a few more to come in. I wanted to also acknowledge um, uh, other writers in this uh, um, in this collection. Um, so we have poems from several. Uh, we have one from Beverly McLennan, uh, who was a SMU student also. Um, we have a, a chapter by Fallon Matthews, also a SMU alumnus, now doing a degree at Dal. Uh, we have a, a chapter by Zane Meji called Spoken Word Saved My Life. Um, Dorothy Christian, who now works at Simon Fraser University, taking a stand, privileging Indigenous knowledge. Um, Tammy's chapter, Tammy Williams, envisioning an intersectional resilience mentorship program for Indigenous and international students. Jyotika Samant, uh, Brown Folks Poetry, and a chapter called Towards Healing Lessons in Surviving Academia from a Queer Brown Femme. Natalie Lozano Nera uh, from Colombia, Settler Migrant Relationships. Artia Rumagam, current SMU student, the embodied transformation of a racialized international student on Coast Salish and Mi'kmaq territories. And the last chapter, A Way of Being, the Making of Transnational Kinship Relations in Institutions of Higher Learning. And that's with myself and Dr. Yvonne Graham. So we have a question for um, uh, Wayne. Wayne, um, this is also from a, a past uh, student here. She's asking you, Wayne, first she congratulates you on law school. And I think as a, a, a young uh, African Nova Scotian, this means a lot to many African Nova Scotians. So I think you that message you're trying to send, it's definitely reaching many youth. Um, um, and it is thrilling to see, quote, I quote, it is thrilling to see a young African Nova Scotian pursuing law. Can you share with us what area you will eventually work in? And you and I recently talked about this. Can you just give an idea of what your vision is um, while you're in law school and then as you exit law school? <laughs> so being young, well, I'm 22 years old, my theory is get in there and start starting to open the doors. Um, that being said, when I first um, decided, like, you know, I was going to go to law school, I thought criminal law would be the route I wanted to go. Like, seeing that a lot of Black people um, don't get justice when they go to the justice um, system. Um, it's usually like a quote um, that I often hear, is it justice or is it just us? And it's usually just us against the justice system. However, um, 
after doing some more, I guess, like work and um, being out there in the real world, I think um, I want to go more into the tort law and work on injury and insurance. And my the purpose, the reason why I say injury is because there's a lot of injuries that our government caused after Nova Scotian people. Um, to this day, Canada refuses to um, acknowledge their part in slavery here in Canada, that it was not just the US or um, let's just say Europe that played a huge role in um, the transatlantic slave trade. Canada played a role in it too, and they continuously cause injuries to us as black people. So with that being said, um, yeah, injury insurance, like, you know, work a little bit on class actions, hopefully in the future and really work on the reparations portfolio, pushing that um, to um, better the lives of African Nova Scotians. Well, I shouldn't just say African Nova Scotians, African Canadians um, and abroad, just so the same um, treatment in my experience is not um, gonna be something that's continuously happening for young black people coming through. Thank you, thanks Wayne. Um, this question is from an old friend um, who uh, finished grad school and writes, um, he's actually just published uh, a book called The Shadows of Mental Health, Ske uh, Seeking Behavior of Racialized and Non-Racialized Student in a University Environment. That's the title of the book. And in it, uh, he writes that uh, the research found that racialized students had high anxiety and depression and often did not seek help. Um, so maybe I'll pause there for a moment. Why don't um, Black, Indigenous students, students of color, international students uh, tend to not go to counseling services or seek help um, in, in the same way that uh, 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 students who are who identify as white, and I'll just open it up right now. Um, uh, Vanessa, can we start with you? Yeah, no, thank you, and really grateful for the topic, and look forward to even reading reading that book. But you know, accessing services, it actually makes me think about during doing my undergrad and graduate degree and during my undergrad you know they had an aboriginal room and um it was a small smaller than the room i'm in right now a little small room in the basement of um, one of the buildings and that's actually where we would go we would go together and come together and share and talk in a safe way as far as what our needs were what was missing what was lacking the hardships that we faced. And I think oftentimes when you see voices be silent in the classroom and in the public spaces, you know, what is that going to be like accessing services? And it makes me think too of the relationship with counseling or with social work, um, that legacy, um, you know, those types of pieces, you know, how much of yourself can you share and is something you're gonna, gonna get flagged in your chart about being aggressive or flagged in your chart about maybe you're not managing your children okay. You know, I was a single parent and continue to be a single parent. And um, my the, the distance of travel that I had to go, thankfully I had the community, but is there an understanding about my community and that although my kids might be in their space by themselves, my, my parents live right next door and my, relatives live right next door and there's a community um yeah you you start to guard what you can share um for the impact and the outcome and that legacy of the outcome of speaking up so really in that little room it would get full and we would uh thankfully it was ventilated we definitely had that smudge burning and lots of tears shed to support each other mm -hmm. and i think you've touched on the the, the kind of spatial politics, the space, how large the space is. And it feels like every university um, 
has uh, resisted providing space for a long time or adequate space to Indigenous students and other students such as uh, Black students or uh, I remember at UBC Color Connected Against Racism. Till today, I don't think uh, we have a space at my universities for uh, Black African students um, or, or specific space for international students without administration. Um, and the smudging is a big thing um, because older buildings at St. Mary's, um, this was a struggle. I remember my first year here, many Indigenous students really, really had to fight to have space. And we had to go through lots of protocol until eventually a protocol um, was developed. So right now, um, for example, there's a, a young Black man who I'm supporting, a student, um, who really needs to go to a counselor. Um, and so I'm co-teaching um, with my mentor, Dr. Brown, and, and Dr. Brown said, you know, you should go to counseling. I'm sure your university must have counseling. You must go. Now all the counselors are, are I think, except one, are white women. And so, of course, I did tell the young, I felt that I was responsible to tell the young men that you can go to counseling and this is the composition. It's an ethical aspect that I must do. And, and, and he said, please don't make me go. Um, and I think that there's also real historical relations, like you say, around social work or counseling, the helping narrative, and around young Black men and white women. And so um, I just want to open it up here to Wayne and Iseline, and I'm going to open it up also uh, to Tammy and Timmy, um, because Tammy, you also provide a lot of support to, to young people. But I'll start with Wayne or Iseline. Why might be some reasons you would not have gone and sought for help from all the student services that may exist in your university? Okay, so okay, I'll go. Um, one of my main reasons why I don't feel comfortable going is if you don't look like me, you don't understand me. I'm going to like, and that's just something I've um, been faced with at St. Mary's um, particularly. White staff do not understand like when I go with my concerns, what I'm going through, it's always trying to downplay your experience, your trauma. And once upon a time, I think as black people, we would have been more okay with that, but as we start to become more comfortable with ourselves, with our like being black and um, realizing that there's nothing wrong with being black, um, we're not gonna take this anymore. I, so I guess, yeah, answering that, it's just a comfort thing. And as you said, Benita, um, a cultural aspect there too, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wayne. Hi, Selena. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's it's when it comes to going to counseling and having, you know, as a student, you're in a space where, you know, a lot of times, you know, students is maybe the first time you're kind of living on your own, you away from home and you're in a new space and a new community and you're in a space that's, you know, predominantly white, you're part of the reason you're getting this anxiety is because you're experiencing violence you know, not like direct physical violence, but you're experiencing violence is, you know, um, you know, complexities with your identity and who you are and, and the subtleties and the microaggressions that maybe you've never experienced before on top of just being a student, on top of just trying to manage that, on top of trying to work um, to support yourself. And I think, you know, ex being able to articulate that experience to, um, you know, a white colleague, a white therapist who, one may not just by virtue of their own positionality in terms of the white privilege that they possess that maybe they might not be fully aware of, it's very difficult then to expect empathy. It's very difficult to expect compassion. And particularly, you know, from, and that's not to say that, you know, white counselors cannot counsel um, students of color, persons of color, but if you do not have that consciousness, it's difficult to include it into your practice. And so it just makes it, it just, it, it, sometimes you, you leave counseling and you feel even worse um, for having gone 
and offloaded because you're just experiencing more violence, unintended as it may be, just because of the, the virtue of the fact that there's just a barrier. We're not stacking at the same point. And you're just, this individual may just not have be conscious enough to, to, to be able to make space that you need for you to be able to respond in the ways that you need or to ask the right kinds of questions to give you what you need um, for your own mental health. Um, and to, to be able to cope. And so, you know, I can certainly understand where it's like, yeah, you know, you just, you just much rather kind of engage with someone who, you know, who, 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 who looks like you or who has a certain consciousness about certain things. You know, like I said, it's, you, you don't, you don't necessarily have to, to be racialized to counsel a racialized person, but there are people who are a lot more conscious and have that kind of education or that experience to be able to offer compassion in their practice. And so, you know, it's, it's a plug for, you know, obviously that needs to be part of, I don't know, counseling training, or I don't know how that goes. I'm not a psychologist, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, it, it just kind of exposes a need for applying um, more, you know, critical race theory and these understandings of, of you know, the racialized experience mm -hmm. um, being a racialized minority. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, this reminds me of a panel I moderated on Monday where uh, a Mi'kmaq, uh, Mr. Silly Boy was talking about how we need to move from this minimalist approach, that we, we can't just have the minimum of these training and exp expertise, we have to move to the relevance of what youth and our students need. Tammy, would you like to add anything here? A friend of mine used a term one time. She. And, and she very much like me, she's pale. And she called herself a light skinned Indian. And after laughing about that for, you know, too long, um, I actually identified with it, you know, and it, and it made me feel like I wasn't alone. So being a light skinned Indian, I'm in the company of people who believe that I'm one of them when I'm not. And I overhear things and I take notes. <laughs> um, but it's really difficult when you walk that line between races. You know, I might be a light skinned Indian, but everything about me is Mi'kmaq other than the tone of skin that I have. So being in that kind of company has created a, a, a huge sense of empathy within me towards people who are marginalized because they are not light like me. And it really made me acknowledge that I might be Mi'kmaq, but I have white privilege. And that white privilege is what has gotten my foot in doors, in institutions, organizations, meetings, where a light skinned Indian is not a threat because they have no idea what lies beneath. That opportunity is really what sort of driven me in everything that I've been doing over the years you know, in, in trying to create safe spaces. Um, Vanessa, your, your work in cultural safety, like as soon as they, Benita did your introduction, it's like, oh, we need to connect. <laughs> I did think about that. I'm like, it's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's something that I'm really passionate about and the work that I want to do as I move on to my next graduate degree includes cultural safety but it also is looking at it through a decolonized lens in the application of transferring the knowledge. So I think what I'm really trying to say is that even though I look the way that I do and I've overheard the things that I've overheard, rather than you know, discourage me from moving forward, it's really lit the fire, you know, and, it, and it's really driven me to continue to keep sticking this light skinned foot indoors that where 
people of color and black people have a hard time accessing simply because they are not white. All right, so I, I think that I'll leave you with that. And I want to also acknowledge your work, Tammy. Uh, you know, when you, Tammy's also, uh, Tammy, uh, other than Vanessa, all the, the folks here are part of our SAN, the Racialized Students Academic Network, but part of your, your commitment uh, that I saw in our SAN was your work with international students. And so that is a very, very rare encounter because we've been taught to keep away from each other. And I think that is part of what makes our SAN a special place. It's one of the few places where Mi'kmaq international students, Black Nova Scotians, people from the continent of Africa, from the Caribbean, where there is this intermixing and learning from each other without a white presence, without a white gaze. So we end up learning a lot from each other because space isn't getting sucked up, right? Uh, Timmy, would you like to add anything about, you know, um, maybe I'll flip it over a little to like, what can our universities do or academic spaces to be more relevant? Um, and I'm going to come uh, to Michelle after with a question, but what, what in your years in, in academia, how can, um, how can we create spaces for students to find that, yes, I can go there? Okay, thanks, Benita. Um, I think I'll first go back to the question about why um, people of color don't go to counseling centers or whatever. When I was at SMU, I am actually trying to picture where the counseling center was, is, I don't know. Um, and as Wayne said, there's also a cultural aspect to it. But there's also another part, and it is that when we sometimes, when we tell white people what we go through, they over-dramatize it. So it becomes like a movie or a story. And then I have to leave my feelings aside and cater to their shock or their heartbreak about what is going on in my life. And that is not my job to do. That is not my responsibility. And I'm just not going to do it. Um, so I'd rather not. Um, what can universities do to create more safe spaces is things like our SAN. Like, I know for a fact that if I hadn't met Isoline, I don't know that I would have finished my degree in the amount of time that I finished it because immediately I got into SMU and I met her. When she told me her story, her journey, um, our SAN is the Racialized Student Academic Network. When she told me all the things that she faced, it kind of prepared me for what I was going to do. It kind of like keep all your communication, make sure you have people at your back to be able to push you on, make sure you ask for help when you need it. So it's those kind of spaces that we need so that people can share their experiences and share the experience in a safe way because I'm not going to tell all my feelings and all be honest in spaces where I don't feel comfortable and I feel like I'm just a show, I guess. Mm -hmm. So Thanks. more safe spaces is definitely needed, as you said, at SMU, there's no space for international students to just hang. Um, there was a huge space, but then they took the international center to like a small corner of the university. Um, so that says a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Timmy. Michelle, as your daughter will exit high school, what do you want to see for her if she chooses to come to university? As a mother, I'm asking you, um, you know, that, that top one or two or three things that you feel, you know, universities better step up and provide this for your, your child. Oh, uh, you're muted, my dear. We can't hear you. Yeah, there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you for the question. It's a good question. Um, my daughter, Shanoa, is um, of mixed blood. She is Mi'kmaq, um, French, Acadian, and Jamaican. 
she presents a uh, very fair skin um, with actually with blue eyes and beautiful, thick, beautiful hair. Um, so her identity is very ambiguous to say the least um, to anyone just looking at her. Um, of course, um, she is a person quite identifiably of color, but uh, the ambiguity in her um, racial makeup is it's not well known until she speaks it. So what I would like to see, where, since my daughter in particular um, crosses racial barriers uh, as far as um, belonging to many racial um, backgrounds, I would like to see that a connection be made for with the student support work um, I'll speak, I'll say for, for Black and Mi'kmaq, for example, because we currently um, come across this quite often with Shinoa because she's, she, you know, she's, she's both. So there's so many um, interwoven, uh, intermixing of Black and uh, Indigenous people, especially here in Mi'kmaq, I'll speak on Mi'kmaq, um, who don't necessarily have the opportunity to um, identify with one or the other example a, a, a black person who has grown up in a predominantly black community but has indigenous blood for example uh doesn't necessarily have access all the time to explore that part of their, their identity of who they are and i see this in my daughter so what i would like to see in the university setting is that merging of these support settings uh First and foremost, as Isa said, they have to create more spaces, but they also have to speak to each other. They have to connect with each other because not everybody fits in one box. Um, our identities are fluid. Our identities um, are shifting and in, in, in always in, in the academic setting. It's vital to, uh, as you talked about, sense of belonging and all those things. Uh, and for our mental health and everything like that, we need to feel centered and balanced and identity really has to be um embraced you know um i recall in university myself um students coming up to me and, and speaking of imposter syndrome um students who knew they had indigenous heritage but didn't know how to connect with that heritage or to um seek out any understanding or knowledge about it and uh felt that it wasn't their place to do so because they felt as an imposter because they had that disconnection to community first and foremost. So um, from for Shanoa, when she enters, I would like, uh, when she enters the university setting, I would like those spaces to A, already be available and accessible, but to be in communication with each other and, and to emerging of, so I don't, I mean, I don't know what the word would be, but to be, um, accessible for for everybody it's here in Mi'kma'ki I don't know maybe Wayne you 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 probably know what I'm speaking on here there's a lot of people in our communities indigenous and black communities um who know of blood and their ancestry but just don't don't have the uh to, the access to discovering maybe uh uh deeper so I've always been a parent to um allow Shinoa to express herself as an individual, but also to explore her identities, not just one, you know? So I, I hope that when she reaches university, she feels comfortable to um, transverse like all, like all groups, you know, as, as one. Like that's what the beauty of our scenes actually um, allows for, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and we want these spaces to be uh, transformative mm -hmm. that uh, students come in and out and know themselves better and are, are wider and bigger intellectually and spiritually and and have you know met people and built good relations mm -hmm. um, just kind of co continuing on 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 that um, and um, um, you know, we've got kind of two questions about um, what are the recommendations, what are steps to that institutions can take and programs, which is continuing from the question I asked. But Iseline, you have a specific question: Is that how do we how do we move and how do we uphold the policies that are being called equity policies without tokenizing 
Um, and so, uh, you know, if we can all think about how do we ensure people have decision-making power at multiple levels, because often hirings of faculty uh, or staff begin at a much lower level with very little power and very little decision making or not or not having tenure. So how do we make changes while avoiding um, tokenizing of the of not only the individual's identity but everything they represent? Oh yeah, that's a really, really good question. And I think it's important mm -hmm. for us to think about, especially now, since we're seeing, you know, a lot of, um, it, it's, it's trending right now. Everybody's doing a push for equity and diversity officers and everybody's getting the message that we need to, to be more diverse. Um, but I think it's definitely the, we don't want to think about equity as just making sure we get the numbers in the bodies. So that's where the tokenization mm -hmm. comes in. And so I think, a large part of not just a large part of, you know, that's one aspect, making sure that we recruit and hire people of color and for their expertise and for their skills. But within these spaces, what are we doing to make sure that the environment is one where people can actually be comfortable and people can actually thrive? And that requires, you know, that requires white people to do the work. Um, I think to do the work in terms of, um, you know, learning about what it means, you know, understanding their own positionality um, as racialized beings themselves, but as, as racialized beings who, 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 who sit on that, who, who experience, who hold white privilege. Uh, and so what does that mean? And what is their role in this process to be able to, to create space and to hold space for, for these bodies who we're now going to see potentially an influx, hopefully in people so that, you know, um, the representation increases. And so how are we, what are we doing in, the, in our environment to, to, to do that? So that, that, that means, you know, particularly in academic spaces, yeah, we have more conversations about including indigenous methodologies and making that an option for, for students to do their research and recognizing that this one size normative um, Eurocentric way of doing research and understanding and ways of being is not enough that we need to kind of open our perspectives. And so, you know, um, you know, we need to do more homework on that. That needs to become more mainstream. Um, what are we doing in terms of, as we talked about, making sure that there can be these spaces for students and for even faculty themselves um, to, 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 to have these exclusive spaces, which are, have been proven research-wise to be vital to their survival. Um, you know, and, and in terms of like understanding that you know, it's okay that maybe, you know, um, some racial marginalized groups need spaces that are exclusive to themselves, um, just to be able to, to, to deal with the systems um, in place. And so, you know, equity policies, I think, need to come along with um, a very intentional effort beyond just saying, we're going to hire to make sure we achieve the numbers, or it's like, okay, we have um, X percent in, in the population. So that means X percent of, of faculty need to be racialized. But in order for us to really combat, um, you know, white hegemony and these systems, which are far more than just eliminating these barriers, we need to think more about what in our environment, what, what are the practices that we're doing um, in order to make sure that people can actually feel comfortable, feel included. And what, what does that mean? What does that take? And it takes self-education for white people to have consciousness raising. And it takes, you know, um, a certain sort of humility to be able to step back into an openness to, to learn and to change. And that I think is the real work because change is had, and we're talking about changing from a system that hundreds of years for centuries has been the status quo and has been so entrenched, but it's time. It's time for transformation and we cannot we need to, when people, when we have to ask ourselves, what are we so afraid of? What are we so afraid of? We need to would always ask them, what are they so afraid of? And so we need to kind of stop with that because that, that's when the change happens. Our, uh, the fear, the fear that institutions carry is their paralysis. That is their greatest weakness. The ability to be creative and to take some risks is, is what we need to, to figure this out. I'm gonna, we're gonna, uh, there's one more question here and I'm gonna look to Tammy and Vanessa. 
Um, this is a question that says, uh, Tammy, can you share your views on decolonization of Indigenous communities, but uh, in relation to resilience? You know who this question is from, do you? I do. <laughs> so resilience, decolonization. Um, I, I think I'll start with sort of a, a, a story about my journey. Um, I didn't understand what decolonization was because number one, I, I grew up down in the States in Hartford, Connecticut and moved up here uh, after I graduated from high school. And although I come from a very traditional family, I hadn't really discovered my tie to the land here yet. And after moving around a lot as a young person, I started realizing that every time I moved, I always came back to Nova Scotia. Something was always drawing me back. And it took me a little bit of time to, to realize that it, it was the land. It, it's the land, it's Mi'kma'ki. It's even more specifically, it's Chibuktuk. Um, being that off reserve person growing up in a very colonialized way, Western way, coming to Halifax and connecting with the Friendship Center was my first real idea of what community was. Um, I do have ties to a lot of different communities through family and relations, but Halifax and the Friendship Center has really been my home. It, it's been the one thing that I could always come back to and feel like I was always accepted for who I was. Then I started realizing, okay, in this journey of, of learning who I was and figuring out what this tie to community really meant to me, that was actually an act of decolonization. It was, it was a process that I had to undergo to figure out like what is influencing how I look at myself, how I look at the people around me, how I interact with others. And the, the journey that I went on was, you know, it was a long one. But then eventually I, I met Benita, who introduced me to this amazing book called Decolonizing Methodologies. And everything started to click. And I started to realize that the decolonization that I was talking about was actually something that I had to actively undergo myself. I had, and I, and in order to do that, I had to understand how was I colonized? What does that mean to me and my life and my identity? And so it was this huge identity journey that I wound up going on. And I really, really got to know myself and I got, I finally felt like I was comfortable in my own shoes. And it was something that, you know, now when I talk about it, 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 it brings up a lot of emotions. One of the things that I grew up hearing from my mom was um, when you're born indigenous, you're born political. You, you don't have a choice, right? And there's a little serial number that we carry around in our wallet that identifies who we are in the eyes of the government. No other, no other race in Canada has to carry around a piece of identity like that. And then I had to fight for my daughters to get one of those serial numbers. And that was just, it was infuriating. So the impacts of colonization just continued to eat away and, and kind of like take bites out of me every, every time I start, started to move forward in my life. And to think about it in terms of community-wide decolonization, number one, that's an awful lot 
to ask of people to go through. To actively tell them that, hey, you know what, you should, you should really identify just how you were colonized and the impacts that that's having on you after we've already endured so much trauma through multiple generations. That's asking a lot. So to ask, you know, to think about it in terms of as we go through these processes as individuals, we have to be supportive of those who aren't ready yet. When you think about it in terms of resilience, we're still here. Mi'kmaq were the, were the first contact. They were the point of first contact here in Mi'kmaq. We're on the East Coast. So when the settlers came, this is where they landed first. And because they were here the longest, that is the longest amount of colonial impact that is felt in North America across Turtle Island. The mere fact that we're still here today and we're still singing our songs and we're dancing the way that we dance and we wear our regalia with pride and honor and dignity and we address all those values that have been handed down through oral histories. That's how we are resilient, you know, in spite of everything, in spite of the fact that, yes, we are dealing with being colonized, you know, our identity is a, a, a plastic card with a serial number on it. We're still doing this stuff in spite of everything, no matter how many times they tried to stop us, no matter how many times my grandparents and great grandparents and aunts and uncles were arrested for, for playing Waltus or for singing, you know, we weren't even allowed to gather in, in numbers larger than what was living in the house at one point in time, because they were afraid that we would practice our, our traditional and cultural beliefs. So, is there resistance to decolonization? Absolutely. Because for some, that's a state of comfort. I just happen not to be comfortable with it when I started to actually realize what it was. I hope that kind of answers the question in a very roundabout, wordy way. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And I would just want to open some space for Vanessa and see if Vanessa would like to, from coast to coast, you both are. Yeah, no, for sure. So there's a couple of things that I want to say, um, one in relation to this question and one in relation to the previous one. Just echoing a little bit of what Tammy shared, you know, you have to, and what I shared earlier, you have to understand what colonization is. Um, at, you know, when I was born, I didn't know, when I was six, when I was nine and 13, and, you know, you can have these experiences of what people think of us from their colonial ideological perspectives and ways of viewing Indigenous peoples on these lands called Canada, but it doesn't mean you've intellectualized what that means. So you need to understand colonialism and colonization and, and place your narrative within that to be able to decolonize and then heal. And I know a relative of mine and I, as we did our graduate work together, <laughs> it's rough, it's hard work. It's hard work doing your healing and looking at that at the same time as um, navigating these systems. And, you know, I, I haven't been raised with language speakers or immersed in ceremonies or those pieces. So for me, it's been about finding the stories, the chaptik, um, connection with people and, and I guess really just uncovering and reflecting where has colonialism grabbed me and how do I unbind myself from, you know, being colonized to become decolonized and how do you do that within colonial systems such as health that I work in now, such as education, doing your degrees and I think, you know, in relation to community, you know, I think the thing with colonization is um, it's done good work as well. And, you know, some, some in our communities, you know, we have become our own oppressors. 
So I, I want to be honest about that is people are at different places of healing and, and seeing what that means. And I also want to say, you know, there are people, um, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it there. We're all at our different places of healing in a community due to these impacts of colonization. And I think of my own journey and how I'm blessed to have my mother and father for, for, for myself and my narrative. And I'll only speak to that. My mother and my father, you know, chose to do their healing. And that in turn showed me what that looks like. And then I could take it and make my healing journey my own. And I, I'm grateful to those who are holders of stories in our, in our, in our, within our people and so that I can learn and grow and share and continue to explore that. And I just want to kind of talk about how can systems not tokenize. I was getting all riled up there and I'm just going to say a couple of brief things because I know we're needing to wrap up here. And I'm so glad somebody at the end started to talk about the fear. And I also am so glad recruitment was talked about because that is an often the often thing, oh, let's get this percentage of this many indigenous peoples or racialized peoples or people of color, and then we've, we've hit something, you know, we've accomplished something. And nobody talks about retention though. You can recruit all you want, but are you creating safe spaces that I even wanna be here? and that I'm safe to be here. Because this work, like I think of my own work in cultural safety, I'm doing this work with my own, and I'm quoting my dear friend, Sheila Lewis, with my body, you know, um, to teach cultural safety about, you know, Aboriginal cultural safety within a colonial institution. I am teaching, I am Aboriginal, and I'm using the term Aboriginal for many reasons right now, but, it is my living experience and I'm trying to create a safe space so that people can understand the colonial narrative and how it's present today so that people can understand colonial ideologies and way of viewing indigenous peoples on these lands. Many I identify as Canada and many who identify as Canadian so that there can be change. And I do this for the people, for those yet unborn, for my children. Um, because I know all around me in my family and community and nation, people are not, you know, when I think of my work or even school, people, people are dying. People are being harmed violently. And, you know, if I can be a part of a solution just by using a voice and creating a dialogue with my body, I know so many before me have done so, you know, I'm willing to do that, but we need to think about that retention and creating pathways so that when we're experiencing racism, we're not being asked to shoulder the burden of proof that I've experienced racism. You know, oftentimes these systems are about guilty, not guilty, I'm right, you're wrong, as opposed to healing and coming together. And it's always, you've perceived racism. There's an allegation of perceived racism. No, I know what I'm experiencing, validate that. And, um, and you know, the work, not just of the institutions, but people create the institutions and house the institutions and hold up the institutions. So I think one of my, my pleas is move through the fear, work through the fear, because if you're immobilized by fear, that's still in action. And know this, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to fail and you're going to fall just as I have. The commitment is about dusting yourself back off and standing back up and trying again, because we, it is about that relationship and humanity and none of us are perfect. I fall and make mistakes all the time, but we do it because we want change. Why? Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I, I want to give Wayne a, a moment here. You wanted to share a few things, Wayne. Yeah, just building kind of off of like it, it worked out perfect what um, Vanessa was just speaking about. Um, Thanks, Vanessa. It worked about, out perfect, Vanessa. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was all planned. Like, <laughs> getting into those spaces, like, you know, it's easy, like, you know, you put that job posting up there, but 
we need to start looking at us as racialized people, our success stories, stuff like that, how it's, I guess now it's more common for black people to have undergraduate degrees and stuff, but there's people I know within my own community that don't have those degrees, but have the capabilities, have that living and lived experience to be in these positions. So I think something that like, when we're looking at faculty, university faculty is what can the universities do to get like, to I guess, give them credit for their lived experience to get them into the door to these master's programs. Um, I think that's something when we look um, also into like counseling psychologists, what can we do to get them into these programs so they can become like these professionals so they can give back, heal um, and educate. So that's just kind of my position on it. The universities need to do a little better um, in ways to get us into this world of academia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up from there is that, so for example, um, by the way, Michelle had to go pick Shanoa up her daughter, so she had to exit, but she sends her greetings and love to all of you. So Michelle, Paul and I, we will co-teach next term in May, a course on Indigenous settler relations. And so one way of bringing Michelle, Michelle has been mentoring many of our students and supporting them. But one, the only way we can facilitate this, that I can facilitate this is for us to co-teach. And I think you're right on, Wayne, all of you, that the Eurocentric way of, of credentials and values really need to shift. And I think we all know that, but no one is willing to do that work and no one's willing to take that policy and put, the moment we say drop the PhD, even at the master's level, you get uh, resistance and the resistance is, well, the scholarship will drop, the quality will drop. And now with the work of Melinda and other authors, Melinda Smith, they've found that actually uh, uh, racialized faculty are much more qualified than white faculty. Statistically, now we have this information. And so I think that it's really important to start to look at different value systems um, and that the lived experience also includes significant training, the training uh, you've all had from, you know, ancestral training or how to be, you know, out on the land or how to engage with community-based learning. So I do think you're right on. And I just want to say around decolonizing, the word decolonizing has been so flattened and it's extremely problematic to throw that word around so quickly, um, how indigenous people from different territories understand decolonizing is very different than the settler. And so I've always said the settler has to decolonize her. But yes, indigenous people engage in decolonizing. And I think that's been a really big issue in how that concept um, is losing its weight and meaning and depth. Um, so I want to thank you all, Vanessa and Wayne and Iseline and Tammy and Timmy. We'll still hear from you. I want to already thank Oyenda. I want to acknowledge that I live on Mi'kma'ki and I um, honor and respect and will continue to build good relations. I want to acknowledge the African Black Nova Scotian community that has been here for hundreds of years. I want to acknowledge every little child who is mixed, Black Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq. Um, and I think that there is a future that is very unique um, there and a presence. Um, and I'm very grateful for how I have been welcomed um, on these territories by these communities. Um, so again, a big thank you. The book comes out in April. And I would like to uh, thank Fernwood also, Beverly Fazila Oyenda, all the collaborators in the book, we are forever connected. So your great grandkids will be like, that's great grandpa Wayne who's in the book with great, 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 great grandma Tammy. Okay. Um, and so I wanna introduce Timmy Idris 
who was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, Nigeria. Timmy holds a Bachelor of Science in Sociology and MA in Criminology. Her area of research focuses on corruption in government, corporate crime, policy development, and food insecurity. She's now an alumnus member. Uh, she's now an alumni member of the Racialized Students Academic Network. And I want to thank you, Timmy, for all the work you have done with our son, including that policy manual that you helped us put together. So Timmy has the last word today. Yes, no pressure. Um, so just what Benita said is why I wrote this piece. It was my protest to academia. Um, when I decided to write this, I was writing my thesis and I just did not feel like using armchair sociology to back up my experience, my feelings, and I just wanted to write my story and also the emotions I felt being in the settler colonial state and my search for safe spaces. So the name of the piece I wrote in the book is Intersections and Contradictions. Who are we? Who am I? Why do I have to explain myself for you to accept me? Shall I break myself into little acceptable pieces good enough for your palate? Tanahisi Coates said, and I saw that what divided me from the world was not anything intrinsic to us, but the actual injury done by people intent on naming us, intent on believing that what they have named us matters more than anything we could ever actually do. The story of us, scratch that, the story of me, Muslim, Nigerian, West African, African, privileged, underprivileged, independent, yet dependent. I stand in this space and time too alien for here and too alien for home. The taste of something that I have lost still lingers on my tongue. What have I lost, you ask? The ability to ask for more without feeling guilty or ungrateful. Do not involve yourself in issues that threaten your presence. Don't make waves, don't make noise, be quiet. Be grateful that you were allowed in. Be grateful that you're part of the chosen few. Hold on, hold on. Just keep holding on. Who am I? A line of strong, beautiful humans. My ancestors go before me. They give air to my wings. I rarely ever am just me. The weight of my communities on my shoulders. Representative, spokesperson. In between double consciousness, the paradox of belonging and unbelonging, I call it inside from outside, insider from outside. A wavering world I thrive in, moving across spaces, but not in a vacuum. Movement comes with code switching, code switching. Our brain's inadvertent way of helping us fit in, an attribute I need these days to survive. Look around you, look. Notice the little things, the one you have silenced because words fall off their tongues differently. In this space and time where it is a shock to my system where the person is a decent human because decent humans are hard to come by. Oh, how dated I have become. You have greatly added to my worldview. However, you have taken so much from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Timmy. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for being with us. And uh, please support our students and our alumni um, and their writing. I am extremely honored and proud to be amongst all of you. Have a good night.